Hi guys, it's Steffi from The Novelty Corner and welcome back to my channel and welcome to a Books Beside My Bed video. If you're new here, I film one of these every week where I wrap up the last seven days worth of reading and for those who are very familiar with the series, welcome back. Also, it is my booktube book birthday today. So happy birthday to my booktube channel. I can't actually remember how many years, it's four or five now that I've been making book videos. So it's kind of cool that one of my books beside my bed videos falls on the same day. So this is my reading week from the 28th of June until the 4th of July. I read a total of 13 books this week and I will be talking about 10 of them. And before anyone freaks out, there's a whole stack of novellas in here and I'm also on holidays and actual holidays, not work from home holidays, actual holidays with nothing to do and no plans to go out anywhere. I read a total of 3,718 pages and my yearly reading total is up to 236 books. Obviously with so many books to talk about I'm going to be fairly brief with most of them and most of these books are part of the Tome Infinity and Beyond Round 4 readathon that is happening for the whole month of July. I have managed to tick off I think seven different challenges out of 22 so far with the books that I've read. So the first part of this wrap up will be the books that I read before July started and then I will move into July and have mostly sci-fi books. Not all but mostly. The first book that I read this week was Gifting Me to His Best Friend by Katie Robert. This is book two in the Touch of Taboo series. It is a 2020 release. Katie is self-publishing it and I gave it 4.5 out of 5 stars. I did receive a review copy of it and I'm really grateful. She writes very steamy erotic romance books and these ones are a series of novellas that cover taboo topics. But the really wonderful thing, and I think I've said it before about Katie Roberts' work, is she manages to somehow make you fall in love with these characters and to develop them in so much depth in a very short period of time in a book that mostly has sex scenes in it without it feeling underdone. And that's why I keep going back to her books. So this book itself is an erotic MMF romance and it follows Emma and Grayson who are a married couple who holiday every year with Grayson's best friend Derek. And the underlying thing here is that both Emma and Grayson have, are attracted to Derek. They decide this year to invite him into their bed. The whole thing is complicated and there's hesitation sort of on all sides because they, they don't know if that's going to change their relationship. Yes, it's very steamy, like this is not something to read if you don't like erotic romance books. But at the same time, there is this underlying emotional level with all three of these characters who have really tried to ignore how they feel about each other for a very long time. The really wonderful thing about this book though is that it's not about power within the married couple's relationship. Emma and Grayson are a really solid married couple who understand each other and who talk to each other. And I think that's why this book works. So I really enjoyed it. It comes out at the end of July. And honestly, it was just a whole lot of fun. Then I read The Lost Soul Atlas by Zana Freeland. This is a 2020 release from Hachette. It is a middle grade book and I gave it four out of five stars. I received a review copy from Neck Alley. I've already reviewed it on my blog and the link is down below for my blog. It follows Twiggy, who is a character who wakes up at the very beginning of the book in the afterlife. He doesn't remember anything about his life really. He just sort of had these really short snippets of memories that confuse him. All he has in this afterlife is a guardian who is a raven. This guardian is trying to guide him towards the gates where he will give up all of his memories forever and live a very happy life in the afterlife. Then he stumbles across another group of individuals in the afterlife and he is gifted an atlas. And if he follows the directions in the atlas, then he will recover some of his memories and he'll also help the other people within the afterlife. It's all very complicated and it's, I'm still sort of wrapping my head around it. As Twiggy goes through the afterlife, they begin to remember everything that led up to them ending up in the afterlife. And we discover that Twiggy was a street kid who had a missing father and had teamed up with another kid on the streets called Flea. And they basically became, became best friends and found family. And it's really about how they survived on the streets and the sort of power dynamics and the people who rule the streets use these kids in different ways to get what they want. So Zana Fraylin really tackles lots of different things within her middle grade books. She has already tackled refugees and detention centers in the Bones Barrow. She talked about child smuggling in her second book, which I've just mentally blanked on the name of, but I'll leave on the screen. And then this one, she's looking at kids who are living on the streets. So she does tackle big topics in kids' books. I said I was gonna be brief. That wasn't brief at all. Then I read Deviate by Jay Kristoff. This is book two in the Lifelike series. It was a 2019 release from Alan and Unwin. I finally picked it up and read it. This one is a really interesting series and obviously being the second book, and I'm actually gonna talk about the third and concluding book a little bit later on as well. It's kind of hard to talk about the series because everything that happens from the end of book one is a spoiler. However, in the first book, we were following Eve who was living with her grandfather and her best friend Lemon Fresh 
in sort of the scrap heaps and they stumble across a boy who is a lifelike so looks very very human and then there's a whole lot of secrets and things that unfold as we discover the origins of the lifelikes and why they are now feared and were and why people attempted to kill them so in the first book we primarily follow eve that's mostly her story deviate is mostly lemon fresh's story and she is a very awesome cool scrappy character who has the ability to shut off any sort of electronic signal and this is where this sort of gets more X-Men in this book. She has to team up with different people. We add characters to the cast that feature very heavily in the third book and the world sort of deepens. So I think Lifelike was very different to Jay Kristoff's other books. It was probably a little bit disappointing and I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way. I think it was just everyone went into it with very high expectations. I think possibly expecting something like Illuminate because I know that I did and it's very different. This book I went into with lower expectations because I knew that it wasn't quite the same and it didn't evoke the same sort of feelings and I enjoyed it a lot better. I'm glad that I read it and I really liked Lemon Fresh as a character. Also Cricket who is a little robot character from the first book features prominently now throughout the rest of the series and Cricket is awesome. I also Red Stone Girl by Eleni Hale. This is a young adult Australian fiction book. It was published in 2018 by Penguin and I gave it four out of five stars. I'm actually going to start this off with all of the trigger warnings because this is definitely a book that you need to be aware of what the trigger or content warnings are before you go into it and before you hand it to a young adult reader. So I'm going to read them out because there's a list. So the trigger warnings in this one, suicide, child abuse, drug use, alcoholism, self-harm, sexual abuse, abduction, derogatory language, abandonment, and domestic violence. Be aware of all of that going into it because this is definitely not for younger YA readers. It is the story of Sophie whose mother has just died and she has been taken into custody or into protection with Child Protective Services. She is, I think at this time, 12 or 13 years old and essentially the entire book is her journey through her teen years as she moves from one children's home to another in the vain hopes that she'll end up in foster care and she bounces around from homes constantly and we see her go from a child whose mother did have a drug problem and Sophie was the adult in the relationship at 12 years old to really struggling because of the devastating effects of living within these group homes. It's a really confronting read it's really hard to read. It's definitely worth picking up and Eleni Hale is someone who had experience in this life and actually did go through foster homes and, and children's homes I believe. So it's a very authentic tale but it's also very hard to read as a result of that so be aware of that going into it. Then I started the Tome Infinity Challenge which was reading sci-fi books and the first book that I picked up was, oops sorry, post-it notes on the front, The Old Lie by Claire G. Coleman and this is a 2019 release from Hachette. It is an Aboriginal Australian science fiction novel and I read it for the prompts to read a standalone science fiction book, a book set on earth and a book featuring extraterrestrial life. I end up giving this 4.5 out of 5 stars. This is another really hard book to read and there are content and trigger warnings as well for, that, for this book so some of them include war, violence, death, systematic racism because this does, it, this really is sort of an alternate history of the colonization of Australia. It features the removal of children from their families a la the stolen generation, suicide, mistreatment of refugees, um, and also testing of weapons on indigenous and native lands, which is actually something that happened here in Australia and it is referenced in this book. So essentially this book is set in the future. Earth has been provisionally accepted into the Federation, a group of alien races, and people have gone on to join the military for the Federation and whatnot. And we follow two characters, Shane Daniels and Romani Zetz. We actually follow more than that, but these are sort of the two main characters that have a very interconnected past that then sort of connects to everyone else in the story as well eventually. Essentially all of the humans have been drawn into a war that's really not their own. And as we go through the book, which is very sort of slow moving and you're not really sure what's happening at first, sort of for the first half of the book, you have to trust that Claire G. Coleman actually really knows her stuff. She's able to weave all of this together really, really well. We begin to find out that all of these stories are connected in some way and honestly this is a very very confronting read. Like all of those content trigger warnings it is very violent and it is very bloody and she doesn't shy away from that detail so but I would recommend if you can handle that to give it a shot because it does really look at and examine and highlight the atrocities committed against our native peoples here in Australia and it's very very thought-provoking. It's very hard to talk about it without spoiling sort of what actually goes on. It does tackle all of those really big issues from Australia's history in a very interesting way 
that still feels very, very real. And I know that when I finished this book, I started going up and looking up more things, which is exactly what I did when I finished her first book, Terra Nullius. I went back and I started researching things that had happened because in Australia, the history is told by the white settlers. And, and we know that that is not the only voice. So yes, this is definitely well worth checking out. Then I read Soft Science by Franny Choi. This is a 2019 release from Alice James Books. I gave this one 2.5 out of 5 stars. I read this for the Tome Infinity prompt to read a book promoting diversity in science fiction. This is actually a poetry collection. It had a really interesting concept, but unfortunately I just felt like I didn't connect with the actual poetry. Not in that I didn't connect with the content of the poetry, but the form and the style of the poetry was just really difficult for me to read. There were some that I started to get into towards the end of the collection, but for the most part, yeah, it wasn't poetry that, that spoke to me. And I think poetry is a really interesting thing to talk about because I think you either connect with it or you don't. And sometimes I don't even think the content matters. I think it's just the way that the poetry is told. And in this case, it didn't really work for me. I also read The Black God's Drums by P. Jelly Clark. This was a 2018 release from Tor. I gave it four out of five stars. It is a science fiction novella. It's more a steampunk science fiction book. I read it for the Tome Infinity prompts to read a sci-fi with fantastical mythology or retelling elements to it and also to read a book that had under 5,000 ratings and at the time of reading this it did. We follow Creeper whose real name is Jacqueline who is living on the streets of New Orleans. She's a young teenager and she has plans of escaping New Orleans by endearing herself to the captain of the Midnight Rubber, a smuggling airship. She needs to find a way to earn Anne-Marie's trust and Anne-Marie is the captain of the ship. She does this when she acquires some information about the kidnapping of a Haitian scientist who has information about a weapon called the Black God's Drums, which has significance to their people. But Creeper has another secret, and that is that Oya, the African Orisha of Winds and Storms, actually speaks to her in her head and grants her powers. And this was just a really cool concept, and I loved that it was set in New Orleans. I loved that it was a steampunk story. It was really engaging. I loved the fact that the gods in these stories were had people that they chose to speak to and grant powers to and the whole thing was just really fascinating and I sort of wish it had been longer it was only a novella length and I think it would have been a really cool longer form story but that said the fact that it could be so engaging in a short form was in a shorter form was excellent as well then I read The AI Who Loved Me by Alyssa Cole this is a 2020 release I read it on Kindle and I gave it three out of five stars I read this for the Time Infinity prompt to read a book featuring robots or androids. I kind of liked what Alyssa Cole was doing with this book, but the first half of the story just didn't work for me. And I, I don't know what it is. I have a feeling that this book may have started as an Audible original story and then was turned into a written book because a lot of it read like it was supposed to be spoken out loud. In it, we follow Trinity Jordan, who we is a young woman living in an apartment block. And we discover that she has suffered an injury of some kind and she has been sent home from the hive which is like a like a massive corporation or the ruling entity in this world to recover and she works from home she meets up with her friends in the apartment block regularly but she's sort of just biding time and she has no memory of what happened prior to her accident then she meets her next door neighbor's nephew uh, leeway who is very standoffish at front and comes across as really weird and we the readers know that he's not human but what we don't know is the connection between leeway and trinity and that's what the story is about them becoming closer and trinity being clueless as to the fact that he is not human and them falling in love and so on and so forth and then there's a, a, a slightly different change of pace with some action sequences at the end i don't know I'd, for this story it just didn't feel as consistent for me i don't know i'm really interested to read more Alyssa cole but i don't know if this book worked very well for me at all. Then I read Network Effect by Martha Wells. This is book five in the Murderbot Diary series. It is the first full-length novel in the series. It is a 2020 release from Tor and I gave it five out of five stars. Is it a perfect book? No. Is it a book that I loved? Yes. I read this for the Tome Infinity challenge to read a book with space travel. Obviously this is book five in a series. It's sort of very hard to talk about it because everything that we know about the main character and the relationship between some of the characters in the book have been developed over four novellas. And if you haven't read them, I highly recommend them. They're really entertaining science fiction novellas to read. Murderbot is a sec unit, so part human, part machine. They're designed and raised to basically follow orders and serve as security for people who can pay for them. And in the very first book, we discovered that Murderbot as it has so named itself, has hacked its own command unit. It no longer requires humans to give it orders. It sort of does what it wants, but it's quite content to do its role, just knowing that when humans aren't around, it doesn't have to just sort of sit there and wait for people to do anything. 
it's actually quite happy to sit there and watch reruns of old science fiction space opera dramas and it still likes to do that in book five. The one thing that we do know about Murderbot is that Murderbot is not particularly fond of relationships, doesn't like people touching it and really finds humans kind of weird and vaguely terrifying. By this point it's sort of used to interacting with humans, particularly the humans that it knows and it's found a way to deal with that a little bit better. It's fiercely loyal to the people that it cares about, although it probably wouldn't tell you that it cares about them. And the really cool thing about this book as well is that we see the return of another artificial intelligence art who was in some of the previous books as well. This book begins with a kidnapping and we're not entirely sure why this kidnapping has occurred, why it has occurred to, to these particular people, including Murderbot. And then we discover that it has to do with a lost colony that has been rediscovered and that something strange is going down on the planet and there is some weird technology and potentially some weird aliens involved and it's up to Murderbot and its fellow kidnapped friends to sort out the mess. It was delightful, it was fun, it's not super fast moving but it was enjoyable. This is the kind of book that just makes me remember why I love reading because it is just that awesome adventure story with great humour thrown in and really cool diverse characters who come from different backgrounds and who see the world in different ways and who have to work together. So I really enjoyed it. And the final book that I'm going to talk about today is True Life by Jay Kristoff. This is the third and final book in the Lifelike series. This is a 2020 release from Alan and Unwin. I gave it four out of five stars. I did receive this for a review copy. As I said, once I lowered my expectations for the series and sort of shifted my perspective on what I, I expected to get from the series, I enjoyed it a lot more. It is extraordinarily hard to talk about the third and final book in a series without giving away spoilers. But suffice to say in this book, the characters have been through a lot and there's a lot of estrangement from different things that have taken place throughout the course of two books up to this point. So we have characters in this book who used to be friends and who have to understand how to reclaim some of that despite everything that they've done to each other and to other people in the story. And we have to find a way to conclude sort of the major lifelike plot line. So Throughout the whole series, there are two lifelikes who are seen as the main antagonists. They're not the only antagonists in the series, but they're sort of the overarching ones. And that is Faith and Gabriel. And Gabriel has been determined to try and create more lifelikes, just like him, because he believes that humans no longer deserve the right to rule the earth. So that's sort of the concluding big picture arc. And then there's a whole lot of smaller things that conclude in this book. Very, very hard to talk about. By the end of the book, we start to see people begin to repair their relationships. The one thing I do like about Jay Kristoff is he's not shy at killing off characters. He doesn't shy away from using that as an emotional device within the story. And I don't mind that because I think too often, particularly in some of these books, is that authors shy away from having that hard-hitting emotional impact of keeping everyone's fan favourites alive because otherwise people will get cranky. So there are some favourite character deaths in this book. Like you go into that expecting it, but I think it's done really well in that way, if that makes sense. Anyway, I enjoyed it. It was an enjoyable conclusion. I'm glad that I have read it. That's a trilogy that's done. And how often do you get to wrap those up relatively quickly? So these are some of the books that I read this week. The others are all on my Kindle. In the comments below, let me know if you have read any of these books or if you're planning on reading them in the future. I hope that wherever you are in the world, you're having a really wonderful day and I'll catch you guys in my next video. Thanks so much for watching. Bye guys.